This next speaker I actually met for the first time at Skepticon 3 when we were doing a calendar shoot, and it was like, hi, my name is Lauren, welcome. Okay, you can get naked over there. And he just rolled with it. What a cool guy, right? I'm really, really happy to introduce, back on the Skepticon stage, John Corvino. Give it up. Laura and I would get naked for you anytime. <laughs> and then I'll have nothing to pin my microphone to, and that would be awkward, so we can't do that. But were it not for that. Uh, hello, Skepticon, and thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your sticking around till the bitter, bitter end of the conference. Um, I realize there are other things you could be doing. You could be at church. <laughs> you could be having sex instead of hearing me talk about sex. You could be having sex in church. I mean, the, the, there are lots of possibilities. Uh, and yet, you chose to, to come here, and I really do appreciate that. Um, and I'm really glad to be back at Skepticon. My last time at Skepticon, as Lauren mentioned, was in uh, Skepticon 3, so it was three years ago, in 2010. And in the time since then, I had been working on some books. And I want to make it very clear, I'm not going to be one of these speakers who spends a lot of time trying to promote his books. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that slide up and let it do the work for me. <laughs> no, but as, as I've been thinking about issues of marriage and sexuality, uh, I've been trying to work together some things, and what I'm going to be doing today is actually a combination of some things that I've been thinking about for a long time and some things that I'm just starting to think about. So if the talk is a little bit disjointed in terms of its polish, that's why, and I appreciate your patience on that. Let me say a little bit about the title, Gay Sex in a Disenchanted Universe. This may be one of these cases where the title is clearly better than the talk, but that's okay. It got you to show up, and that, that's worked out so far. Um, and I mean, I, I may have I'm thought about actually calling it gay marriage in a disenchanted universe, although like most marriage equality advocates, I don't really like the term gay marriage. It makes it sound like we're looking for something special, gay marriage, as opposed to marriage. We want what other people have, which is marriage. You know, when we go to get a driver's license, we don't get a gay driver's license. <laughs> when, when we're hungry, we don't have a like, gay dinner or gay breakfast. Well, it's called brunch. But <laughs> right. um, but, but, but gay people have been seeking marriage. And in the three years that since I've been here, it's like a lot's happened. You know, it's Hawaii state number 15, Illinois will be state number 16. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And um, this means that a third of the country is now living in marriage equality states. So in any case, I'm going to be talking about sex. I'm going to be talking about marriage. The disenchanted universe part of this came from an article that appeared in Commonweal. I'm sure you're all avid readers of Commonweal. It's a religious magazine. Um, uh, by Joseph Bottom, better known as Jody Bottom. Well, that was not a joke line, but <laughs> that's it. I, no, I really did think about making bottom jokes, and I thought, no, that would just be tacky, but somebody laughed anyway. <laughs> I love it when people laugh at the jokes that I didn't make. It, 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 it bodes well. Um, back in August, Jody Bottom wrote a, a piece called The Things We Share, A Catholic's Case for Same-Sex Marriage. And this was noteworthy because Jody Bottom had been editor at First Things, a very conservative Catholic publication. He was well known and well regarded in conservative Catholic circles. And for somebody with that background to come out in favor for, of marriage for same-sex couples would be pretty striking. Uh, very different from, for example, when David Blankenhorn did this a year or two ago. Um, Blankenhorn, for those of you who don't know, was one of the lead, actually the only witness called in the Prop 8 case uh, in favor of Proposition 8, which stripped marriage rights from same-sex couples in California. He is the founder of the Institute for American Values, a longtime opponent of same-sex marriage, but 
Blankenhorn's opposition was always a kind of measured opposition, and he always said, look, this is not about good against evil, it's about competing goods, and he always used to acknowledge what he called the equal dignity of homosexual love. So many people thought that, you know, Blankenhorn wasn't really a conservative anyway. In some ways, he actually was quite liberal. Um, Jody Bottom, without question, conservative, and for a conservative to come out in favor of same-sex marriage, was pretty striking, or would be pretty striking, if that's in fact what he had done. Although, despite the subtitle, which he himself approved, it's not really clear that he was making a case in favor of same-sex marriage in this piece. In fact, if you read the piece, and it is a long, meandering piece, and many people have commented on this. My favorite, Wally Olson said, well, when you don't know what you want to say about an issue, you go out for a long walk. And that's kind of what he did in this article. He goes for a long walk, um, and nobody's quite clear on where he's going or where he's supposed to be ending up. Um, it, it, there's, it has a sort of meandering quality to it, but some of the interesting things he said. The thin notions of natural law deployed against same-sex marriage in recent times they're unpersuasive, and they deserve to be unpersuasive, for their thinness reflects their lack of rich truth about the spiritual meanings present in this created world. Basically, the arguments that people have been offering against same-sex marriage don't really work anymore. Same-sex marriage advocates have better arguments, have better logic than their opponents, given the premises available to the culture. So he's concerned about the way the culture is right now, and its lack of access to spiritual meanings. And he wants a reprioritization. It wasn't so much that he was arguing in favor of same-sex marriage as saying the church really ought to back off this issue because there are much more important things for the church to be doing. Concern about same-sex marriage ought to come low on the list of priorities as the church pursues the evan evangelizing of the culture the goal of the church today must primarily be the re-enchantment of reality. Now, there was a lot of reaction to this piece. People in, on my side of the issue, on the marriage equality side, were kind of excited that, oh, a conservative has switched sides. Yay, another victory for us. Except if you, again, if you read the piece, it's not really queer, clear, it's not really queer. <laughs> neither that nor clear um, whether he's really switching sides. Uh, and some of the commentary since then suggests he wasn't really trying to switch sides so much as he was trying to say that um, the church ought to reprioritize. Now that's good, right? I mean, look, I don't expect in my lifetime that the Catholic Church or conservative Christians more generally are going to, you know, change position on marriage equality. But if, for example, the Catholic Church were to treat marriage equality the way it treats things like contraception or divorce, where you know, other people do that and we're not gonna like, pour tons of money into fighting that and making it more difficult for people to do that, hey, that would be a big improvement, so that's good. And he recognizes that there's a difference between civil, legal marriage on the one hand and sacramental marriage on the other hand, and just because we have a certain view of sacramental marriage doesn't mean we ought to be imposing that as civil marriage, that's good. So there's, there was a lot there to be excited about. But this re-enchantment of reality thing, it's almost like, well, if we keep um, fighting this marriage battle, nobody's going to find the church's views very convincing anymore because we're just going to look very discriminatory. And so really, the way to sort of win back the culture is to back off of that for a while and focus on other things and it's kind of a, a strategy thing that oh, that kind of concerns me actually I don't I'm not sure I want you to be re-enchanting reality thank you very much so what I want to do today is talk about what this means I mean what is this enchanted notion of reality that makes sense of opposition to same-sex marriage but that is no longer available to the culture today and the way I'm going to do this um, having just talked about Jody Bottom, I'm going to talk about the book of Genesis and the way religious believers find in that story norms regarding sexual relations and marriage. I'll spend a little time on that. Then I'm going to talk about historically how philosophers tried to create the same kind of view without appeal to revelation. And in particular, I'll talk about Thomas Aquinas and the natural law. 
Then I'm going to talk about some contemporary philosophers and political theorists, people like Robert George at Princeton, who offer what they call new natural law. And I think it's very important for us to understand their views because they constitute probably the most serious attempt to provide intellectual backing to right-wing causes. So far you're thinking, I thought this was going to be a talk about gay sex. Yeah, this sounds really, really sexy. Um, I told you the title was better than the talk. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm going to go back to this notion of enchantment and sex, and particularly gay sex. So just to give you kind of a map of where we are and where we're going. But let us start with Genesis. So you go to the book of Genesis, and you find in Genesis 1, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Uh, in popular parlance, this is Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> to which I always say, of course it's not Adam and Steve. If they're gay, it's Adam and Stephen. <laughs> Uh, the idea here is that God has a plan for humanity, and that plan is expressed in the fact of sexual differentiation. We are male and female, and somehow that male-female difference reflects divine reality. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. The, the idea of men and women coming together sexually is part of some divine plan. Now, one thing you can notice about this is that part of what's happening here is that people are reading into the text more than is actually there. You see that, I think, even more when you get to the second creation story. Did you know this? There are actually two creation stories, like right next to each other in Genesis, like one after the other, they're probably by different authors, and they're actually inconsistent with each other, like God does things in different orders. But um, in the middle of Genesis 2, you get the second creation story. Um, and in the second creation story, uh, God recognizes that Adam needs a helpmate. It is not good for him to be alone. And so God tries to provide that, and God like, brings him um, various creatures and animals and so on, and Adam's like, no, no, no. And then God brings him Eve, and he's like, this is more like it. I'm paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> this is more like it. Uh, and Adam says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of this man this one was taken. God had made her from Adam's rib. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. They complement each other, complement with an E, that's in the sense of complete. Um, I, I mentioned the spelling issue because I was once doing a marriage debate, I'm not going to say where, Idaho. Um, <laughs> I was doing a marriage debate and this woman named Tammy comes up to me, I talked about her in the, the first chapter of, of my latest book, this comes, comes up to me and hands me this pamphlet called God's Plan for Marriage. And one of the things she has in the pamphlet is, God created Adam and Eve to complement each other. C-O-M-P-L-I-M-E-N-T. <laughs> hey Eve, that's a nice fig leaf. Thanks, I got it on sale. <laughs> Complement in the sense of completing each other. Um, becoming one flesh, and we're gonna see that phrase later on when we're talking about natural law. But notice that God does this and says that it's good. He does not add to that, and any alternative arrangement is bad. That actually is a non sequitur. It doesn't follow from what's already been said. You have to read that into the text. Um, Genesis is not written as a rule book. It's written as a narrative. It is trying to explain some things. One of the things it seems to be trying to explain is the fact that men and women come together. They in engage in these relationships. And what's that all about? And you have a story written to try to explain that. To take that story as a blanket condemnation of same-sex relations, as many religious believers now do. I've had so many religious believers say to me, you know, you, you always focus on these like proof texts of Sodom and Gomorrah, Romans 1, and so on, but really it all goes back to Genesis. And I say, well, you can go to Genesis. Genesis says 
man and woman, this is good, but it does not say other things are bad. It's like, you know, if I come over to your house and you make me a chicken dinner and I say, this is really good, it doesn't follow from that that you would have done something wrong had you made lasagna. That just is a non sequitur. And what's more, once you get into that practice of reading stuff into the text that isn't already there, well, two can play at that game. Uh, particularly with the second creation story, Notice what happens in the second creation story. It's not that God makes some executive decision. Here's the helpmate for you. God brings various creatures to Adam, then brings Eve to Adam, and Adam is the one who says, yes, this is the right one. Adam gets to be the expert on his own heart. And it seems to me that if you extend that same courtesy to gay people today, you don't get, you get quite the opposite of what you're looking for. And people say, well, you're reading a whole lot into the text. I'm like, well, no more than you're reading into the text by claiming that from this we have this normative rule that all sex and all marriage must be heterosexual. But the interesting thing is that many people say, look, we don't need Genesis, we don't need the creation stories, we don't need revelation at all to reach these conclusions because we can look to natural law. And probably the best known historical proponent of the view of natural law that I'm going to be talking about is St. Thomas Aquinas, there he is. Not a very flattering picture of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and you're probably familiar with um, the basic idea here. Uh, first of all, let me say something about the basic idea of natural law. We call it natural law because we can know it simply by observing nature through reason. We don't need any special revelation. And this is going to be common to both the old natural law, Aquinas, and the new natural law that I'll be talking about shortly. Um, and among the things we can know is that there are certain morally correct, morally proper ends of sex and marriage. And we can know that by looking at the sexual organs. They have clear functions. Their function is procreation, just like eyes are for seeing and ears are for hearing, genitals are for procreating. And to use them for some other purpose is unnatural and wrong. Now, what's the problem here? I mean, there are a number of problems, but one problem is that many of my organs have multiple purposes, right? I can use my mouth for talking, for singing, for breathing, for licking envelopes, for blowing bubbles, for sucking dick. <laughs> you know, when I, when I give versions of this talk on campus, I always say for licking envelopes, blowing bubbles, for kissing a woman or for kissing a man, but I promised you a talk on gay sex. I said, I'm gonna say sucking dick. <laughs> And when I do it, it's research. Uh, <laughs> I walk into my campus office, you know, Monday morning looking really tired. Busy weekend, research, yes. <laughs> Lots of research. Lots of research. Um, so, I can use my mouth for all of these different things. Uh, when we're talking about the sexual organs, it seems that we, we can use them for a variety of things. I mean, really, uh, Aquinas' view seems to be a fancy version of the parts don't fit. Um, and for those of you who know my work, you know that I actually have a very simple response to the parts don't fit, which is, yes, they do. <laughs> because I've done research. Um, <laughs> and while the sexual organs clearly are for pre procreation, they also seem particularly well suited to other things like you know, the pursuit of pleasure, the expression of a kind of intimacy, and so on. So how is it that we can limit their use, their only natural use, to procreation? In fact, what's interesting is that Aquinas himself seems to anticipate this objection when he says, you know, well, because Aquinas is very good at anticipating objections. His writing is always like objection one, objection two, and then he replies to the objection. So one of the objections he says, well, you know, what if a person is walking on their hands? That's not what hands are for. Would that be wrong? And his response to that is, well, but that inordinate use does not undermine the proper use of the hands, whereas using your, your, your sexual organs for non-procreative purposes, that undermines the great good of procreation. Except that it's not clear that it does. It's not clear that sodomitical acts, to use the preferred term from the other side, sodomitical acts, uh, so we're not just talking about homosexual acts, we're talking about oral and anal sex between heterosexual couples, mutual masturbation, personal masturbation, all, all of those things, sodomitical acts, non-procreative, non-coital sex, 
um, somehow undermines the good of procreation, but it's not clear how they do this any more than, say, celibacy undermines the great good of procreation, and Aquinas, as you may remember, is a monk, <laughs> a celibate monk. Um, as Jeremy Bentham, a great utilitarian philosopher, put this several hundred years ago, if gays ought to be burned at the stake for their failure to procreate, perhaps monks should be roasted on a slow flame. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's not just skeptics who have this problem with this parts don't fit natural purpose view. Even contemporary natural lawyers see that there's a fallacy here. Um, and Robert George is probably going to be the best example of, the, uh, uh, of this claim. Um, George, let me tell you a little bit about him. He is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University, spent the last year at Harvard University. He is the co-founder of the National Organization for Marriage, uh, which fights same-sex marriage across the country and across the world. He is the co-founder of the right-wing Witherspoon Institute. Serious, hardcore, conservative, Roman Catholic, um, well-respected uh, by people in that, that camp. He and a group of other new natural lawyers, most of whom are conservative Catholics, not necessarily all, um, think that Aquinas' natural purpose argument, in fact, or at least that interpretation of it, doesn't work because he says, it is not clear that acting against a biological power is necessarily wrong, nor is it clear that sodomitical, there's that fun word, sodomitical and other non-marital acts are really contrary to that direction. That is, it's not clear that when you use sex for other purposes besides procreation, that you're actually undermining the good of procreation. Any more than when you're celibate, you're undermining the good of procreation. So the new natural law theorists need to find some way of making the same sort of claims without using that perverted function argument. And what they say is, look, we can't read these normative claims into descriptive premises about the way the organs work. We need to access normative premises directly. We need to have access to some fundamental basic goods. And what they do is they start with these basic goods that we sort of intuit or know directly. Now a lot of people say, okay, I can see where this is going. So somehow they have access to these truths and if the rest of us don't see it, we're but in fairness to them I want to say this. Every moral theory is going to have some basic premises. I mean, take something like utilitarianism. We ought to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And if you ask me, okay, but why is happiness good? I'm like, come on, really? I mean, you, you either see that or you don't see it. Um, so the new natural lawyers say, look, there are certain things you either see that they're good or you don't see that they're good. And if you don't see it, the best I can do is to try to sort of jog your intuitions by drawing out the implications of the view. So what are some of these basic goods? Well, some of them are kind of obvious. Health, that sounds pretty good. Knowledge, that sounds very good. Oh, and there's another one, it's the basic good of marriage. Okay, this actually shows up fairly late on their lists. You know, when people like John Finnis and Germaine Grise were writing in the 80s, marriage wasn't on the list. Suddenly in the 90s, oh wait, we've discovered a new basic good. Marriage not as a political or legal institution, but as this two in one flesh union of the husband and wife, where they complete each other, where in their sexual acts, and their ex particularly their sexual acts of coitus, penis and vagina sex, they literally, not metaphorically, literally become one organism. Okay, um, there are some immediate kind of objections that, that one might raise to this one organism view. But put that aside for a moment. Um, it, one worries that we're gonna have the same problem we had before when we were talking about Genesis, the same sort of fallacy. Well, okay, let's suppose we recognize that good is good. Why do we think that other forms of sex are bad? You know, okay, so fine, you've got this marital good, you want to pursue that, that's great, but the rest of us want to pursue something else. Why is that bad? And here's their answer. Because either sex aims toward marriage, this two and one flesh union, or else it involves treating yourself and the other person as a mere object. You're just using the person as a way of getting sexual gratification without respecting their personhood. So it involves a kind of disintegrity where you separate off the personal self 
from the bodily self. If I may quote Robert George, this is him writing with Patrick Lee, if one chooses to actualize one's bodily sexual power as an extrinsic means to producing an effect in one's consciousness, are you with me so far? <laughs> then one separates in one's choice oneself as bodily from oneself as intentional agent. In such a choice, one treats the body as a mere extrinsic means. One regards the body as outside the subject and so as a mere object. What does that mean? <laughs> Look, actually, I'm, I'm, to, to be charitable, I, 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 I think I know what that means, or I think I know what he's aiming at, and I, I think most of us have some sense of what that can mean, because we can all imagine what it's like, uh, and we know people do this, when people treat sex in a depersonalized way and you end up just using the other person. The person to you is not a person, they are simply an object. Your, your goal is to just get off and as far as you're concerned it could be that person, it could be some other person. You could plug yourself into an experience machine if you had one available. It doesn't matter, you're just interested in getting off and the person, qua person, doesn't matter to you. That's bad. Okay, I get that that kind of dehumanizing approach to other persons is bad. But why should we think that every sodomitical act, every act of non-coital sex, every act of oral sex, every act of mutual masturbation, every act of anal sex, is just for that purpose? Why not think that, no, I'm a bodily person engaging in this activity with another bodily person expressing things in this bodily human way? I'm not separating off the subject from the bodily self, whatever that means. I am a bodily subject engaging in a sexual interaction. And so, I mean, if I, if I may use a fancy word, because we're kind of in the neighborhood of fancy words right now, what we've got here is bad sexual phenomenology, just a bad account of what's going on in people's minds when they seek various forms of sex, including various forms of sex besides coitus. Now, the reason I'm so concerned with people like Robert George and the other new natural lawyers is that they have become probably the most prominent conservative intellectual group fighting marriage for same-sex couples. And you see that particularly in a recent book came out this year, What is Marriage, Man and Woman of Defense? It's co-authored by Sharif Gerges, Robert George, and Ryan Anderson. George, as I mentioned, is a Princeton professor. Gerges, graduate student at Princeton, now also doing a law degree at Yale. Uh, Anderson, graduate student at Notre Dame. The two of them did an article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, which they expanded into a book called What is Marriage? And very quickly, let me give you their argument for same-sex marriage, because again, this is intended to be a natural law argument. It's supposed to not appeal to any theological premises, but be the kind of thing that anybody, regardless of their religious beliefs, even if they have no religious beliefs whatsoever, should be able to understand and accept. Marriage is, by definition, a comprehensive union. It's a union of mind and body and spirit, if you believe in that, uh, emotional, intellectual. It's a full, comprehensive union. You are totally giving yourself to the other person. A comprehensive union must include bodily union, because otherwise you'd be leaving out a part of yourself. But the only way you can have bodily union is in the act of coitus, penis and vagina sex. Same-sex relationships cannot include coitus. Therefore, same-sex relationships simply cannot be marriage. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> um, there's a problem with almost every premise here. Maybe not the fourth one. <laughs> Same-sex relationships cannot include coitus. All right, I'll give them that. I mean, you know, same gender relationships, but if we're talking about biological sex, okay, fine, uh, yes. A lot of the problem has to do with this sort of fuzzy notion of comprehensive union and bodily union, and what is that, and why can't same-sex couples achieve it? Why does it require coitus? And as you might imagine, the usual objection that's given here has to do with sterile heterosexual couples. Imagine a heterosexual married, actually, a heterosexual couple who cannot um, procreate, let's say the woman's uterus has been removed for medical reasons. So we know that procreation is impossible. 
doesn't it seem to follow that either they cannot achieve this bodily union that's supposed to be directed toward complete completeness and procreation in some way, or same-sex couples can achieve bodily union. It seems like an inconsistent standard. And the new natural lawyers say, no, 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 um, there's an important difference. Their sexual act can still be of the procreative kind. No. <laughs> the whole point in calling them sterile couples is that it's not of the procreative kind. It is precisely not of the procreative kind. And, and so in their book, they, in the article that they based the book on, they explain. Union on any plane, bodily, mental, or whatever, involves mutual coordina coordination on that plane toward a good on that plane. When Einstein and Bohr, uh-oh. <laughs> Ready, Skepticon? When Einstein and Bohr discussed a physics problem, they coordinated intellectually for an intellectual good, truth. And the intellectual union they enjoyed was real whether or not its ultimate target, in this case a theoretical solution, was reached. By extension, bodily union involves mutual coordination toward a bodily good, which is realized only through coitus. And this union occurs even when conception, the bodily good toward which sexual intercourse as a biological function is oriented, does not occur. Except that there is an important difference between a goal which does not occur, even though people are honestly seeking it, and one which cannot occur, and thus cannot be honestly sought by anyone aware of its impossibility. I mean, this would be, the proper analogy would be Einstein and Bohr working on a physics problem that they know in advance to be unsolvable. Are they coordinated toward a solution? No, because they know that there is no solution. Might there be some value in their doing it anyway? Sure, there might be some flexing of the mental muscles or something like that, but the good toward which they're aimed is not a solution, and in a similar way, the good toward which the sterile heterosexual couple is aimed doesn't seem to be procreation. But let's suppose we grant them this. Let's suppose we grant that um, coitus, even for ster sterile heterosexual couples, is of the procreative kind in a way that sodomitical acts are not. There's another objection, and it's an objection I've raised a number of times. I call it, let's call it the Bob and Jane example. Um, Bob and Jane are engaged to be married, and shortly before their wedding, there's a terrible accident, and Bob becomes paralyzed from the waist down in such a way that he will never be able to perform coitus. Now, not all, this is not true of all paralyzed people, but let's suppose in Bob's case it's clear he will never be able to perform coitus. And Bob says to Jane, well, I guess we cannot marry. And Jane says, no, 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 I, I still love you. We're, simply, we're going to, to make this work. And so they become legally married, and they spend the rest of their lives together. Perhaps they adopt children, raise children together, Maybe they spend 50 years with each other until death do they part. Question, were Bob and Jane really married or was this just a counterfeit marriage in the way that the new natural lawyers would describe same-sex marriage? Now, I told you I've raised this objection many times before and I was hoping that in their book they would respond to it. And they did. In an end note on the next to last page of the book, Buried in the back, like if you have to like go to the back to read the end notes. And what they do is they ultimately bite the bullet. They say in the strong view, yes, it's true, that's not a real marriage. No wonder they buried that in the end notes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's an embarrassing feature of their view, right? That they have to say that, you know, they, they really gotta keep coitus as part of marriage because otherwise how are we gonna keep same-sex couples out of this and still allow the sterile heterosexual couples? But okay, if we're gonna keep coitus in, we can't let Bob and Jane in. They, I mean, they do some sort of like soft version where they say, well, it would be intrusive for the state to ask. And, no, 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 you, you think that this is not marriage because marriage requires coitus. Um, and that strikes me as suggesting you've got a really um, counterintuitive view, view about what makes a marriage and what's important about marriage. Um, but what they say is that, yes, okay, our view has some counterintuitive implications, but so does your view, John. And what we have to ask is, like, which view 
fits better generally with people's intuitions about marriage. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about a couple of their challenges to me and give you a couple of responses. Um, I, I do this at, at greater length elsewhere, and I'm happy to point you to some resources, some of which are on my website. Um, so one of uh, the things they say is, well, historically, non-consummation, meaning you know, couples that did not engage in coitus, that becomes grounds for annulment, for declaring that the marriage actually never really happened. Now, that's true historically. Uh, for the most part, those laws have been discarded, which suggests that our understanding of this has evolved. But it's also important to recognize that, and it all, I, I should also add that the non-consummation uh, rules and so on had a lot to do with outdated notions of female purity, you know, strange understanding of how pregnancy happens, and so on. So th th there's all of that. There are a lot of ways to explain this without adopting the, the view that they put forth. But I also want to point out that just because your marriage could be annulled on the grounds of non-consummation, it does not follow that any legitimate marriage has to include coitus in order for it to be legitimate. And a good way to, to, to point this out is to say, okay, so imagine the bride and groom, they get married, they're leaving the chapel, and on the way out the door, the groom is shot and killed. The bride at that point is a widow. She would be treated legally as a widow. She would be treated by the church as a widow, regardless of whether they had a quickie in the sacristy on the way out. <laughs> because I mean, marriage was fundamentally initially about the commitment, the vow to each other to have and to hold, for better or for worse, not about coitus, although coitus might be a part of the fuller picture. Then they say to me that, well, my view can't really explain why polygamy is wrong. I actually am not sure that I want to say polygamy is always wrong. I think there are reasons to be concerned about instituting it legally in this country. Um, but putting that aside for a moment, um, it's not clear to me why their view explains why polygamy is wrong. Well, they say, you know, it has to do with the comprehensive union. Marriage can be achieved by two and only two people because no single act can organically unite three or more people at the bodily level. <laughs> Unless they're very limber. <laughs> or therefore seal a comprehensive union of three or more lives at other levels. At this point, I think what becomes very clear is that this vague notion of comprehensive union is doing a whole lot of work, right? Union on all the levels, and if I'm united with this person on all levels, I can never be united with another person on the sexual level. But wait a second. I mean, comprehensive union doesn't mean you're always united at every level all the time. Otherwise, married couples would be engaged in perpetual coitus. That might sound fun for a minute, but really, that would be very inconvenient. Think about it for a bit. Um, you know, union with people on intellectual levels. I mean, Gerges, George, and Anderson wrote a book together. Have they written books with their wives? I mean, just, just there are different ways in which, comprehensive union. It's like, well, we're drawing the lines in the way we want. And we, 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 we're, I mean, comprehensive union makes for good anniversary card poetry, maybe. Um, but it's not giving us a compelling view that is um, going to make a persuasive public argument, and increasingly people are recognizing this. Joseph Bottom recognizes this when he talks about the premises available to the culture and why these arguments deserve to be unpersuaded, unpersuasive. Um, Gary Gutting at Notre Dame, uh, whom I believe is still Catholic, said, although the bishops claim that their views on these topics are knowable by natural reason without the aid of revelation, hardly anyone except conservative religious believers sees the force of the rational case. That's noteworthy. So where does this leave us? Okay, I want to wrap up by going back to the notion of disenchantment. In this long meandering article, one of the things Jody Bottom says is, one understanding of the sexual revolution, the best I think, is as an enormous turn against the meaningfulness of sex. The actual effect was to disconnect sex from what previous eras had thought the deep stuff of life. God, birth, death, heaven, hell, the moral structures of the universe, and all the rest. 
Well, I want to take God, heaven, and hell off the list. But I'm not sure, as someone who largely is in favor of the sexual revolution, at least understood in certain ways, that we should take birth, death, moral structures of the universe off the list. I'm not sure, I don't see why the effect is to disconnect sex from meaningfulness. What is it about sex that makes sex so awesome? Well, part of it, and I want to make this very clear, part of it is its connection to the creation of new life. That's pretty awesome, and it's an awesome moral responsibility, and I would never deny that that's huge. But that's clearly not the only part of it. Part of it is the kind of comfort and acceptance you get from another person when that person is literally naked with you and vice versa, and you engage in this wonderful and messy and silly and complicated and delightful and joyous act together, not treating the person as a bodily object, but as another person in all of their complexity. Now, I think this is something that all of us can appreciate, but I think it's something that's especially important to gay people. Why? Because as gay people, we were often told from a very early age that our sexual and romantic desires were sick, unnatural, perverse, deviant, immoral, foul, all of these negative messages, messages that we often got from our own families, from the very people that we normally go to for support and security, we heard all of these awful things. To be able to break through that and to delight physically in another person and vice versa can be especially powerful and especially sweet. And to bring this back to the issue of marriage, to find someone who is willing to do that with you over and over again, despite your quirks, despite your love handles, despite your morning breath, despite all of these things about you, is willing to have that kind of vulnerability with you, is a wonderful, beautiful part of the human experience. Thank you. And so I want to say we do not need to see God's fingerprints everywhere to connect sex up with the deep stuff of life. Or to put the point another way, if it's enchantment we are looking for, we need to look not up there, but in here. Thank you very much. Thank you.